Uh, empowering smart cities, so I'm a geographer by background. Um, I've been involved, uh, interested in urban sustainability for about 20 years now. Uh, over the last 10 years, I've become more closely involved in smart city projects around technology. Um, but my real interest, uh, and I think this is something Liz alluded to earlier, uh, is in what technology can do. What are we innovating for? Um, in terms of how this relates to SmartLine, I think really that the issues I want to get onto in this talk towards the end relate more to how uh, place and innovation inter interact. What does place-based innovation uh, mean? Uh, so I think it's worth remembering, this is projections around the split between urban and rural populations globally. Uh, we are a growing species. number of people on the planet is going to level off at around 10 billion by the end of this century. Of those 10 billion, about three quarters will be in cities, so we're an urbanized uh, species as well. Um, some interesting projections uh, from some demographers a couple of years ago around the largest cities in the world. You can see a lot of this urban growth over the next 30 years is going to be in Africa. Uh, pushing 90 million people in, in Lagos alone. Uh, we've all heard of Lagos. There's places like Niamey, uh, where else on here? Blantyre, Lilongwe, um, cities which currently have, I don't know, two, three million people going to grow maybe ten times uh, by the end of this century. And these are mid-estimates. These aren't the upper estimates from, from this paper. Uh, so cities have become, I guess, the epicenter of a lot of concerns around uh, health, well-being, carbon emissions, pollution, wealth generation, mobility, uh, energy provision, and so on. Uh, so I guess that's why uh, I find myself focusing on cities. But most of the problems I'm hearing discussed here actually relate to places, uh, buildings, communities, and so on. And that's really what I want to talk about a little more today. One of the things that fascinates me is that we often have uh, a bunch of technological solutions. So can anyone tell me where, uh, where, which development this is? No? Uh, this is Beddington Zero Energy Development, BEDZ, South London. Peabody Housing Association uh, came up with this. It was completed nearly 20 years ago. You can see a lot of familiar features, solar panels, passive heating cooling, oriented to the south facing, no cars in the middle of the development, uh, a successful development on every single level. Residents love it, the planners love it. Uh, it's worked really well. Does the rest of London look like this? Absolutely not. When you get the train anywhere in this country, do any of the houses being built look like this? Absolutely not. So this is interesting, right? Everyone accepts we have some big problems. And I would suggest that we actually know what a lot of the solutions are, but they don't scale. We struggle to actually implement them. Uh, the challenge of creating change. And this is kind of the, the silver bullet, the $6 million question that everyone's at now. So I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes talking about one project I've been involved in which has tried to address directly this issue of scale-up. It's a smart cities and communities project funded by the European Union under the Horizon 2020 program called Triangulum. Three cities, so-called lighthouse cities, Manchester, Eindhoven, and Stavanger, which are supposed to demonstrate uh, some new exciting solutions. Uh, and then we evidence them. And then the follower cities of Leipzig, Prague, and Sabadell try and replicate uh, those solutions. Uh, the solutions are developed in low-carbon uh, smart districts, uh, and they relate to energy, mobility, ICT. It's a big project, a bit like SmartLine, 25 partners, uh, businesses, large businesses, small businesses, municipalities, housing associations, university. The bigger picture is essentially this. Everyone kind of thinks technology is going to help deliver sustainability. There should be this sweet spot. But there's actually a bit of a question mark there. When you look in the literature, it's quite hard to find robust 
evidence to prove how technology does or doesn't deliver sustainability. Most of the discussions still at the uh, abstract level of, well, it could, because this might happen, or it could not, because this might happen. So our starting point uh, for being involved in this project was really to try and understand how we could better monitor and assess the various implementations going on in these cities. It's things like uh, low energy houses, um, energy generation, use of batteries, deployment of electric vehicles, uh, and essentially this is, this is the kind of standard model. When this stuff gets done, you have some investment, you have the solution, you have a return on investment, but there's usually a subsidy somewhere. When you look at most of the projects that have been implemented anywhere in the world, if you dig a little bit, there's usually some kind of public subsidy. And obviously, if they're going to scale, we need to get rid of that subsidy. So our idea was around, and it's, it's not a very new idea, but I think it's an important one. If you're going to scale things, you need to be able to capture that broader value. So there's a whole bunch of uh, distributed benefits, if you like, that most sustainability uh, solutions offer. The idea is if you can capture them and add them all up, then these solutions then become economically uh, viable. So the model we came up in the project was essentially one of capturing impacts to drive uh, replication. This was the preferred word from the European Commission that was written into the course. We had to talk about replication. So it's the idea that you demonstrate in real world environments, monitor them for at least two years, capture all of the distributed impacts and then that will somehow provide the evidence base uh, for replication. So we ended up with 30 different technologies being deployed, uh, 70 use cases. So for example, uh, some of the technologies were deployed in residential homes uh, and also in care homes. So that would be one technology but two use cases. Uh, we ended up measuring 242 different impact indicators, which in hindsight was far too many. Uh, I wish I'd known about those five well-being indicators at the start of this project. We could have saved ourselves a lot of bother. Um, and then we attempted to take some of these uh, solutions and help the follower cities uh, to implement themselves. Reflecting on this model, it's actually essentially a market-driven model. Um, it, it, it has a kind of belief that the reason these solutions, things like BEDZ, haven't scaled is because there's a lack of evidence. That's the reason the Commission thinks. I'm an academic, I'm a researcher, I quite like that reason. Like, brilliant. We deal in evidence and monitoring stuff and empirics. Um, but I think it's quite a naive belief. So the idea is if you generate enough evidence about the fact they work, and then you disseminate that evidence, then the market will do its magic, and everywhere will uh, suddenly use these things. Um, so I've got like a couple of challenges that have come up through doing this. One is around evidence. Uh, the idea that there's this um, almost infinite amount of data just sat there, ready to be used. Uh, it's what I call the urban data bottleneck. Uh, there are serious issues with, with getting hold of data. Often data does exist, but whether you can actually access it and whether you can actually use it is an entirely different question. Some of our solutions uh, like the electric cargo bikes in Manchester, it turns out the data wasn't held by Manchester Bike Hire because uh, they essentially bought a solution for the trackers on these bikes that was a third-party solution, and they didn't even own the data. So not only didn't they, they didn't control it, but they didn't have any ownership over it either. So we were suddenly in a situation where we had to pay for a lot of this data. Uh, and you can see uh, all different combinations of, of, of things. So the idea that there's just this huge amount of data that you can find uh, turned out not to be true. And we ended up having to do quite a lot of work with partners to co-produce uh, a monitoring framework, which actually identified what they had, uh, what they could monitor, what they did monitor, what they actually had access to. Uh, so there was a little bit of uh, real politic, I guess, around what you could measure. Um, let's skip that one. The second challenge 
uh, was around this idea that cities uh, can be like customers in a marketplace, that there is this thing called the urban marketplace in which, I don't know, different kinds of solutions, whether it's um, bike share schemes or smart grids, could be sold. Um, cities aren't really customers. Municipalities don't see themselves as customers, and they don't really have much money either. Um, they're not singular organizations. I work in an urban institute, and we're always talking about cities, but what the hell is a city? Who is a city? Is it the residents, the local authority, the other uh, municipal authorities, police, fire? Is it the roads, the trees? Who knows? The real crux of it, though, is uh, cities don't want off-the-shelf solutions because they're not appropriate to their specific challenges. Uh, this picture here is from South Manchester. It's a floating bus stop. Anyone seen these before? Yep. Where do you see one? In South Manchester, that one. That one! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Curry Mile. Yeah, this is it. Amazing. Um, so this, this took about two years of lobbying transport planners in Manchester to experiment with this uh, type of infrastructure. So this street is, links the student area to the university, lots and lots of buses. Uh, every year, cyclists get squished by buses. So when they were redoing uh, the street, they got a £50 million grant to upgrade the infrastructure. Um, there was a lot of pressure on them to adopt this kind of infrastructure that separates the bikes uh, from the buses. Uh, but they weren't um, convinced. Uh, they put one in, just one, this one, and they monitored it robustly for about six months, uh, and they figured out that people were worried about bikes hitting pedestrians. So they put in these little crossings. That was the way they tested it out to see if it worked in Manchester and adapted it. Um, and this is highly innovative. They then rolled them out along the entire corridor. They'll put them on the other main roads that they upgrade to over the next few years. Now, I show this slide uh, to planners in Malmö in South Sweden, and I said, this is urban innovation in Manchester, and they fell off their seats laughing, because <laughs> they've been doing this for about 50 years, 40 years, 50 years in Sweden. But this is the point. Urban innovation is about where you're doing it. It's innovative for Manchester. So the replication model says the same thing, just gets stamped out like a widget in a load of different places. doesn't really work like that. Cities don't want that. When you look at what is being replicated in our project, it's actually um, the vehicles through which innovation happens. So Leipzig have created an urban living lab, like Eindhoven have in, in, in their living lab area. Sabaday have copied the Oxford Road corridor from Manchester, which is a partnership between the universities and the city council to innovate together. So ironically, most of the replication is around the governance models whereby you replicate, uh, sorry, you innovate in a place. The living lab approach has been extremely uh, popular in terms of staging single experiments that you monitor from and then learn and adapt for the place you're in. And what you actually see, rather than replicating, is something a bit more like propagating, like the way uh, strawberry plants put out runners that then find some fertile patch of soil uh, somewhere else. And it's much more uh, random and harder to follow. So you can rethink replication. It, it doesn't really work like that. Place matters. Replication actually happens within organizations, within a single city. It can take place between cities. Uh, but you have to understand the wider benefits, and you have to get some way of learning what works. So the final challenge I wanted to talk about was just to take a step back to, OK, so what does urban innovation look like? And for the purposes of SmartLine, we'll substitute place-based innovation for urban innovation. Um, the first point I'd say is it's important to innovate in typical settings. So this is another project I'm involved in working in East Africa, informal settlements uh, on IoT deployment. Uh, and this is a simple project where IoT sensors are put into water towers to see how much water is left in those towers, because no one can tell normally. Uh, and then people, residents, can get little messages to their phone telling them where has water. So it saves them quite a long walk to different towers, saves them hours of queuing, only get, get to the front of the queue and there'd be no water. 
This is a problem that affects a large proportion of the world's population, and it's a cheap solution that, that can apply to loads of them. Unlike some of the stuff we've done in Triangulum, for example, the development of uh, more efficient electric car charging posts in Norway, which then the mayor of Brno uh, in Central Europe says, well, we don't have any electric cars. In fact, all of our electricity still comes from coal. Uh, so that solution, not so much use. The second element is around aligning innovation with needs. I usually talk to smart city people who are interested in energy and mobility and so on, and this is news to them. The things that actually cost local authorities money is social care. In fact, this is the graph of doom that shows in a couple of years the costs of social care are actually going to be larger than their entire budget. They will have no money to do anything else. So we need more stuff that addresses this. This is what technology needs to be addressing. You guys are already doing that, though, which is great. The final point is that this kind of stuff needs to replace business as usual. This is a project I'm not involved in, but it's a great project in Barking and Dagenham called Participatory City, where they've taken a lot of these kind of social networks, social innovation um, ideas that I've heard talked about here, but the local authority are actually funding it from core money to replace other kinds of service delivery. So it's not an add-on, it's not an as well as, a nice to have. It actually becomes part of the local authority service delivery. Uh, and as someone who's interested in governance, that's really where you make this stuff stick. It only scales if it becomes part of business as usual. Otherwise, the project ends, the money runs out, and everything stops. And some of the organizations who um, really take this, heart, to this to heart have, have fundamentally reorganized themselves. Eindhoven Planning Department now only have three departments, program design uh, and execute. They got rid of waste, land use planning, transport. That's the only three departments they have. So technology, to be fully uh, exploited, you have to change the way your organization is structured and works. And what we've seen as well is the entire urban ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem shifts as well. Uh, more connections within organizations, but more connections bilaterally between organizations as well. And it seems to me that's something SmartLine has done too. So my conclusion is fairly simple. The traditional model of research and innovation where you give the best, cleverest people in the world a bunch of money to come up with something even more amazing isn't the right way to go when you're looking at fixing places. You have to do something more place-specific. Uh, the ability to experiment and learn in place is essential. But equally, the ability for organizations to actually change in response is also key.